Welcome to the Wolf Connection Podcast. I'm your host, John Kalfa. Let's talk about some wolves. Joining us today from Madison, Wisconsin, he is a professor of environmental studies at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and he's also the founder of the Carnivore Coexistence Lab. Please, uh, it's a pleasure to have Adrian Trevis with us here on the podcast with Stephen and myself. Adrian, thank you for joining us. How is everything going in Wisconsin? Thanks for inviting me on, John. It's a pleasure to be with you and your listeners. Uh, It's good. We've got spring starting to peek around the corners. Yeah, we got a little, I think it's 80 degrees here in California right now, which is, uh, I'm not really ready for that yet. But uh, yeah, the snow is melted and we're heading towards spring. So um, so what I, I want to start, Adrian, because we had, uh, we have, we've had a couple of Wisconsin individuals on before yourself. We had Rachel Tilseth on, and I believe Ellen Brandell w- is working in Wisconsin at the moment. But I really want to hit on if you can tell a lot of our listeners and really the, the general public, what is the Carnivore Coexistence Lab and what is, how did it get founded and what is the mission and the goal for that, uh, for your particular project? Yeah, so I founded the Carnivore Coexistence Lab in 2007 at University of Wisconsin-Madison and the goals were to understand uh, the conflicts and the coexistence challenges and opportunities that people around the world encounter when they live near large carnivores like bears, big cats, wolves, even spotted hyenas out in Africa. And we have uh, usually about half a dozen projects going on at once in different countries. A lot of our work is with wolves, but an equal amount is uh, looking at non-lethal methods of protecting livestock and other domestic animals from those big predators so that we can achieve conservation goals and coexist uh, without lethal methods, without having to kill anything. So did you get started, what were your first projects? Were you, did you jump right into wolves or was it bears first, cougars? What was the first carnivores that the coexistence lab started with? Okay, well, my history of uh, working with carnivores goes a little further back. So I got fascinated by predator-prey behavioral ecology. That's uh, like the interactions of prey animals with the predators around them. I got fascinated by that back in the 90s when I was a PhD student and I was studying monkeys in Uganda. And the monkeys I was studying were preyed on by eagles and chimpanzees and leopards and some other predators. So I started learning about carnivores at that time. And in 1999, uh, I looked at uh, archival historical data from Uganda about the colonial period when the British protectorate had killed uh, thousands of lions and leopards for the skin trade, for sport, or to make the landscape safe for cultivation, as they described it at the time. So I actually uh, came to large carnivores from the African carnivore perspective initially. But when I moved to Wisconsin, uh, I was fortunate enough to be handed a stack of data relating to human, wolf, and livestock coexistence challenges here in northern Wisconsin, where wolves had recolonized on their own without direct reintroductions. Hmm. Did you notice any immediate parallels between the animal experience on those continents and the plight or conflict between humans and wolves here? Yeah, great question, Stephen. Um, Yeah, almost even the same phrases. We heard Ugandan farmers blaming the government's cattle, by which they meant elephants. They were blaming the government's cattle for crop damage and uh, accusing the neighbor, that is the national park, of not being a good neighbor, not keeping the wildlife inside the national park. And we heard very similar phrases applied to uh, gray wolves here in Wisconsin by the beef cattle producers that at the time uh, and to this day are the ones who probably have the most trouble coexisting with gray wolves. So yeah, a lot of similarities. I mean, people are people around the world and um, a lot of you know cattle are cattle around the world. And so the large carnivores you find in those wild ecosystems sometimes uh, can't find wild food and then they turn to those domestic animals. Mm -hmm. And that begs the question, you know, when you say humans are humans are humans everywhere. What do you think it is about 
you know, because naturally you'd think that people who want to live a lifestyle on the edge of wild places would also want all of the the challenges, the contrast, and the excitement and the adventure that comes with that. What do you think it is about living on the edge of wild places when the focus is industry? There seems to be an inability or an unwillingness to accept that living in such wild places will come with wild experiences that may be uh, inconvenient. Yeah, that's also a good question. So again, jumping between Africa and Wisconsin, um, the Ugandan farmers we were working with were to some extent pushed to that wild interface. It wasn't their first choice. They were caught between a, a rock and a hard place and, and they wanted solutions. And they were often very happy to take non-lethal solutions. The, it didn't jump to mind for them immediately that they had to kill the wildlife that came to them. Although bush pigs very popular uh, food species for them. So when bush pigs came out, they were more than happy to kill those. Everything else they just wanted to keep in the park and away from their crops. Now you get to a place like a wealthier nation like the U.S. Um, but, and even in Wisconsin, there are people who move by choice to live in the wilder areas, right, for all the amenities, all the uh, recreational experiences, the appreciation of nature and, and of wildlife. Uh, and yet seem to be surprised when they uh, have find black bears uh, walking through their property or see a wolf. And sometimes they overreact. But I'd say on average, and probably the majority of people are there because they love nature. And one of the abiding take-home messages I got from our Human Dimensions work, that is our interviews and our questionnaire surveys of Wisconsin residents, is that very, very few want to eradicate wolves. It's just a very vocal minority that uh, would put the the mighty dollar in front of the mighty nature and prioritize industry, as you put it, or livelihoods over conserving wolves. So I think the uh, the silent majority is out there willing and ready to protect and preserve our wild nature. Uh, they just need to make their voices heard. I think, aren't there correlations too with the way I don't know if I was reading this through some of your work, that elephants sort of do the same things as cattle in that they, when they feed and they, and they stomp on the ground and they're sort of making the the land better, don't they do some of the same sort of processes that actually keep the earth continually turning and, and making, you know, the soil rich and, and sort of moving all that stuff throughout? And do they, do individuals understand that though that's a natural way for elephants to graze and, and really just keep the ground plentiful for them. Uh, yeah, John, you, you, you put your finger on something. Uh, elephants are often called ecosystem engineers, uh, the same way humans will turn up uh, soil and tear down vegetation, rip out trees for our own purposes. Uh, elephants seem to do the same. Now, it depends where you are, what what the ecosystem is like, whether that's going to make it more diverse and rich and productive or less so. And so uh, it's difficult to make generalizations. It's not like elephants are... Um, you know, managing the land for everybody's benefit. It's for their own benefit. And sometimes that can harm certain other species. Right. So when you see this correlation, so when you come from Africa to here to Wisconsin, what were the initial, I guess, the initial things that you saw when you, when you started your, you know, your started your teaching and your, the coexistence lab that, you know, you were able to draw from Africa and implement, you know, those, that knowledge when you were working with wolves? Well, I'd say there were two things that it took me a few years to understand the system and and start drawing those conclusions. But I'd say there were two conclusions I came away with by about 2005 to 2009. One of them was about the need for experiments for coexistence, meaning we need to experiment with the non-lethal methods that are going to promote coexistence. There's no one-size-fits-all cure-all. Lethal management is not a cure-all. In fact, it's less effective than non-lethal methods that have been tested so far. And it's also not inexpensive. Like People like to say a bullet is cheap. Yeah, but the technician who knows what they're doing is not cheap. So non-lethal methods are more effective. They're often as, in, as costly or less costly than lethal methods. 
And what's more is that the scientific standards of evidence for non-lethal methods have been more rigorous and robust. And that's because traditionally people have been skeptical about non-lethal methods. That's what led scientists to do experiments so they could prove effectiveness. Now, um, the U.S. has been super slow in this regard. Uh, other, other parts of the world have been faster about embracing the need for experimental evidence. And then you asked, what else did I come away with? And it comes back to the, this idea that humans are humans all around the world and the way they respond to scientists and to wildlife can be similar. And uh, I've learned that uh, our government and a lot of people like to make assumptions about what the people think. And they do it based on the little bubble we each live in, right? And so we're seeing a very small slice of the huge population that's out there coexisting with wildlife or living in cities, but enjoying wildlife, wanting to know they're there. We make assumptions about that small slice that we experience that everybody feels such and such a way. And one example of that is that governments all over the U.S. Uh, have repeated to us in one form or another, blood buys goodwill. That idea, blood buys goodwill, is this idea that by killing a few predators, you're going to buy the goodwill of people. You're going to increase tolerance for the predators, and you're going to be able to conserve the surviving predators after you kill a few. Well, we've been studying that question now for 12 years, and the answer is just no across the board. The science doesn't support that idea, and yet governments still cling to it. As recently as December 2020, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Assistant Director said the same thing in a letter to the California Fish and Game Commission, you know, as if we hadn't been sending them our work and calling them as often as we could. So, yeah, it's hard to shake some of these myths loose. Man, so let me... What do you what what can you attribute to the I, I guess the lag of the United States and its population to wrapping their head around using methods that seem to be and as Stephen and I have have continued to to navigate this issue and navigate these topics with other individuals, they seem to be more economically good for farmers, ranchers, governments, things of that sort, individuals, as opposed to, just like you said, going the lethal route. Yeah, you probably have seen this in your work, people's uh, gut reaction or the things they'll say to you about wolves, right? There's a lot of fear out there. There's a lot of hostility. Fortunately, there's also a lot of questions people are willing to learn from experts like yourselves. Um, what I think happened in the U.S. is a combination of our um, a sort of a dominant population with Euro-American roots. Yeah, Euro-American roots where, um, you know, the myth of the Little Red Riding Hood is still alive and well out there. And it's not really balanced out by positive imagery of the wolf, like the founding of Rome. Um, Whereas other cultures have a very different relationship to wolves. You take the Ojibwe, saw the sovereign tribes of the um, Great Western Great Lakes region, and they revere the, the wolf as brother or companion in their creation story and are the most tolerant individuals that we've ever measured, tolerant of wolves. So um, there's a cultural aspect to our fear and uh, ignorance and hatred of wolves that I think then leads to lethal management. The second thing is, the, as you say, the power of the mighty dollar, which we unfortunately built a misincentive into our predator control agency here in the US. Uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture Wildlife Services gets paid by counties for responding to wildlife problems. And they seem to prefer killing predators, they're not paid for solving the problems. They're paid for responding to them and killing animals, which is a misincentive for actually solving problems. And it turns out the leading evidence right now is that uh, coyotes have spread across the U.S., partly because wolves were eradicated, partly because USDA has been killing so many coyotes that that actually increases their populations and causes a rebound and recolonization. So we had this misincentive built into our uh, one government agency, and it's defending its turf like you wouldn't believe against new evidence, 
against non-lethal methods, even against independent scientists like myself. So when you're, what is the difference? Tell everybody the difference if you can, because I, I was just having this conversation, I don't know, probably not 15 minutes ago, where there's there's a difference between culling herds or managing the populations for biological reasons. And then of course there is culling like we've been talking about for political reasons, for sport, uh, dare I say. And, you know, as I, tr- I'm really trying to, you know, go the middle here. What, what's the, what's the difference between those two and why does the pendulum swing so heavily in either direction at any one given time? Wow, there's a lot in there, John. Um, you go ahead and inter- interrupt me or reel me back if I don't quite answer that. Um, so the history of wildlife conservation and management in the U.S. and Canada is pretty much still dominated by folks like uh, Teddy Roosevelt and, and Pinchot back in the early part of the 20th century, late 19th century. And they perceived quite correctly that record, sorry, that commercial hunting of wildlife from, you know, waterfowl to deer to wolves was driving them extinct, those wildlife populations. And their response to it was to regulate commercial hunting and turn hunting into a pursuit for food, for meat, for fur, for feathers, turn it into instead a sport, a recreational uh, practice for gentlemen hunters, right? Gentlemen sportsmen. Uh, I'm putting air quotes around that because that was their perception of themselves. Um, the problem, I mean, that was a successful conservation movement in the early part of the 20th century. The problem is uh, a guy in Canada by the name of Val Geist uh, and assisted by hundreds of people turned that into let me restate it so it's easier to understand. So Roosevelt and all them, they understood you had to regulate commercial hunting in order to avoid the extinction of all these uh, large animal populations in North America. The, so what they designed was a system of regulated hunting, like one permit or you know a bag limit for every hunter. Unfortunately, in the 70s and 80s, that became... For shorthand, hunting is conservation, that hunters saved wildlife. And that has led, I believe, to some extreme forms of hunting that are not conservation. They are not protecting wild animal populations. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has also led to a fixation on a few game species like white-tailed deer, elk, ducks, you know, turkeys, um, and not caring for all of the wild animals in our in our native ecosystems and so predators in particular bear the brunt of a hunter culture that wants more deer and fewer wolves um, so i think it's time to move on from that uh, old model of the sportsman hunter who will care for game populations we we need you know we need to protect the legacy of of all biological diversity for future generations and not rely on hunting as the tool for management not when humans are encroaching on habitat everywhere and we're causing sometimes irreversible damage to our native ecosystems right there has to it has to be a broader a broader perspective a broader interest in in wildlife as a concept but it seems to be that humans can't uh, I don't know. <laughs> they it's it's hard to it's hard to think uh, in a sphere that large. So we focus it on a certain thing, and then we still call it the same concept, which kind of ends up being it's a really tricky spot to defend. Yeah, I mean, you said it, Stephen. It's partly it's a shift in worldview. <laughs> so we're not viewing animals as things we can use willy nilly without worrying. Uh, it's, we have to shift uh, our thinking to a worldview that says they're fellow travelers with us on this planet and we're the caretakers for future generations of all life. Do you see that in the, in the I don't know, because we had Rachel Tilseth on and I don't want to misspeak or misquote, but I believe the indiv- the people that live in the northern part of Wisconsin, I think it's the North Country, please correct me if I'm wrong, 
and no, that's where those individuals choose to live. That's where those tribes are. They're the ones that are able to coexist with these predators, with these, with wolves. I believe bears are up there. I, I don't know about mountain lions. How do you, how do you wrap your head around that there are individuals that can do this and are they able to teach others how to live with and coexist with these predators and prey alike uh, in their own backyard? Yeah, so there's a lot of good examples of people who never lose livestock or other domestic animals, uh, despite living near coyotes, black bears, cougars, and wolves. I'm going to shout out to Mary Falk of Love Tree Farm, who runs uh, you know Blue Ribbon Award-winning um, uh, sheep dairy, a dairy sheep farm. And um, on their property, they've had breeding coyotes. They have wolves pass through every year. They have cougars and black bears. And the only time they ever lost uh, sheep to carnivores was when somebody killed the alpha female of a coyote pack in their area. And the result of that killing of an alpha female was the, the youngsters of the coyote pack wandered around unable to hunt as a team started looking for easier, more predictable food, which was the livestock. So Mary Falk talks eloquently about living in wolf country and cougar country without killing anything and without losing any stock. And they rely on livestock guarding dogs. These are special breeds of dogs that bond to the uh, domestic animals. They don't live in, they don't come into your kitchen. They're not that kind of dog. They live out in the barn. In fact, she has six of those dogs. The last time I spoke to her, she did. And she tells a great story about how they work in shifts. Three will be out patrolling their huge property while the other three are sleeping in the barn. And when the shift changes, the three sleeping in the barn get up, stretch, look for breakfast, which means they follow around some hens till the hen lays an egg. Then they gobble it down and then they start patrolling. And with that team of six dogs, they haven't had any problems in 15, 20 years. She's just, for me, an icon, an emblem, a model. And some of her neighbors are listening and some don't because some of it has to do with beliefs and perceptions. Uh, even if they're, you know, even if they're hearing from their neighbors that you can coexist peacefully. Yeah. I was listening to a podcast about a mule deer. I think I can't remember the exact nature of the study, but she was dropped off very far from where she originated and somehow was able to find her way back to that spot. And, I think inevitably teach her young to follow that same route step by step and um, how, you know, how these, this knowledge is passed on from generations. And you would just think that the same thing would apply here, that it almost makes sense for preventative measures to keep animals alive so that they can pass this information down because they do somehow. Um, maybe I, 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 I don't know if we'll ever be able to, perceive the exact methods through which they do, but they do, they pass on information somehow. And, and um, you know, I wonder if there's any evidence to suggest that that happens with wolves as well, that if you leave a pack intact and they're able to teach younger generations where to go and where not to go, that potentially um, a more, a more intact population might cause less problems. Yeah, Stephen, I think you hit the nail on the head. And, and actually the research of my postdoc, Dr. Francisco Santiago Avila, where he studied the Michigan uh, state program that killed wolves when there was an attack on cattle on a farm, he showed that it actually tripled the risk for neighboring cattle, that if you use non-lethal methods, the risk was one third as high or, or you know, it, uh, it wasn't like the the risk you got from killing wolves. And we're thinking now, I mean, the leading hypothesis is that the wolf pack breaks down or newcomers come in and they're going to turn to the most predictable food supply, which is livestock on fenced pastures, even in grazing allotments. They're so much more predictable than any kind of wild prey like mule deer. So, um, a, when, a, when a team, like a wolf pack, which is a team, right, they defend the territory as a team, they reproduce as a team, they hunt as a team. When humans mess around and kill a team member, that team does not work as well. And some of the, some of the teams break apart. Others really struggle for a while till they get back on their feet and can hunt the wild prey like white-tailed deer that they prefer. Every study shows they prefer white-tailed deer to cattle. So what are some of these non-lethal methods we've 
we've spoken with Suzanne Asha Stone. We've spoken with uh, Karen uh, Vardaman. What are some of the non-lethal methods that you and your team, your colleagues are trying to implement? As you said, with Mary Falk, guard dog, not, I, want to, I don't want to say guard dogs, but guard dogs to a degree. I've heard range riders. I've heard ranch dogs. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, Flagery. Are, are there any other methods specific to the Wisconsin Great Lakes area that seem to be working better than others and that have maybe taken foot in, uh, in those ranching areas? Yeah, we're seeing livestock guarding dogs taking hold. Um, so in Dane County, where I live in Wisconsin, there are a group of sheep owners who swear by livestock guarding dogs and they won't kill. They resist killing coyotes in their area because they say that's when the problems crop up. Um, so that and a, a technique called flagry, which is a Polish word uh, for visual deterrence. It's like flagging that's hung from fence lines. It's pretty important. You have to tie the bottom of the flagging too. So it's not flapping in the wind to be effective. Um, so livestock guarding breeds of dogs, this flagry stuff seems to keep out wolves and is very showing a lot of promise for coyotes. And then uh, we did an experiment with Fox Lights, which is a random light device. It's a solar powered, uh, turns on at night and then it charges by day. And when it turns on, random colored lights spiral around the, the, uh, the landscape. And uh, that seems to deter pumas in, in the okay. um, high Andean plateau of Chile. Although it didn't work, ironically, it didn't work on Andean foxes. So we recommend it to the manufacturer that he rename it when he sells it in Chile, you know, Puma lights or something. <laughs> and then uh, we have an experiment on range riders just uh, wrapping up this summer. Uh, we'll have the results out this summer from Naomi Lachauarn, uh, who was working in Alberta. And, um, and she works with a close colleague of Suzanne Stone's, a guy called Joe Engelhart, who, uh, who practices a special kind of range riding. Uh, this is not just throwing a guy out on a horse. Uh, it's You need them to be trained in a special kind of stockmanship where they're keeping an eye on the herd in such a way that they're going to encourage behavior that's anti-predator behavior that can be flocking um, more closely avoiding certain kinds of um, uh, cover that predators are going to use, especially if mm. there's predator sign at the time. And if there's an injured animal or a sick animal, the range rider takes it in to shelter right then mm. and there. So range riding is like a non-lethal cowboy who's paying attention to the to the cattle or the sheep or whatever. Yeah. Um, and sorry, we're just one more fun experiment in Southern Africa. Uh, this was just <laughs> published last year. They painted eye spots on the rumps of cattle, and it seems to deter <laughs> lions. So that's another one, fun one. <laughs> that's unreal. Yeah, we were talking about this in the last podcast. I think it was the last one, uh, or maybe the second to last one, but just about how the long-term solution is to have cattle behaving more naturally like like animals ha that have to worry about predators. And it's almost it's it's almost as if the process is – through which we raise cattle and 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 sort of handle cattle and even in like a physical sense, um, have them behaving unnaturally. Hundred percent, yeah. And and you can have your cattle being docile and having no clue about predators if you're defending them with, say, electric fencing or human herders, right? You can imagine those scenarios too. So really what our lab does is we work with the livestock owners to, to tailor the best non-lethal method to their operation. And we're working in total collaboration with them. We bring the science, we design the experiment, but they figure out the, the, the proper design engineering operations that's going to work for them so they can keep making a profit. And this model, is, we've tested this in so many places now, it works well, we're exporting it, but we're only one team. We really need government backing. And so far that's been difficult because uh, of the agency I mentioned earlier, the USDA Wildlife Services, that itself does a lot of non-lethal experiments, but that's just overwhelmed by how much lethal control they bring to every situation. So, because it would be interesting to, for me to see if this was presented to the government or any of the governing bodies, that this is a way to still have 
producers of livestock be able to still be still, still thrive economically and really not affect their bottom dollar while keeping the environment as natural as possible, this would be something that would be backed. What are the roadblocks that you're that have been encountered as you try and, and sort of roll this out on a larger scale? As you said, you're one team, but what are some of the things that you've hit so far? Yeah. So one of the things I do is this kind of a blog and I talk to media several times a week. You know, we've been covered over 2000 times in the media and all, since the founding of the lab. Um, also, Senator Booker of New Jersey and Senator Carper of Delaware invited us very generously and hosted an event under the U.S. Capitol so that staffers of all the um, House and Congress who are interested in these issues could come and listen to us talk about non-lethal methods. Suzanne Asher Stone was very much involved in that effort. Um, Ranchers from the Tom Minor Basin uh, also came and spoke at that event. I spoke there. I think, you know, it's partly a question of generational change, but the public today needs to reach out. They need to reach out to their legislators, to their governors, to their natural resource boards and wildlife commissions and tell them what they want to see. And that's how we're going to make slow, steady change. I also need to um, advocate for eating less meat in our diets. It doesn't mean you have to go vegetarian or vegan, but eat less meat because right now, uh, the human population is just just an insatiable uh, drain on natural resources, and livestock are really exemplify that problem. We just there's just too many of us eating way too much food, and that is, I mean, it's just not it's not a sustainable method of eating. I mean, it's unfathomable how many people there are. I don't think I think people underestimate how many of us there are, and even even doing what might seem like the right thing conceptually with billions of people is still a problem. 100%. You actually, you said it better than I did. This is the, these are the conversations that we want to have. And these are the opinions we need to hear from all different sides. And what I, what I want to ask you on top of that is that how do you have these conversations then with the livestock and the ranching community so that they understand that what you're doing is not going to hurt their bottom line. In other words, how receptive are they to taking in all this information? Because from what it seems like you've been telling Stephen and myself, it's fairly, people want to do this and it doesn't seem to really hurt their operation that much. Is that what you've encountered or has there been pushback? And I think the, co- the, the, the conflict also is that it is going to affect someone's bottom line. And so you have to convince them that there's something else that could potentially be more important long-term. Well, yeah, I mean, you guys said it. Um, So one thing I guess I'd like your listeners to realize is that there is a super big difference between the frontline livestock owners and their representatives that we hear so much from. Right. Representatives tend to be extreme. Whatever side of the aisle you're on, the representatives of groups tend to be more extreme than their constituents. So what do I mean by that? Well, we get invited by livestock owners to work with them, to do experiments on non-lethals. A lot of those livestock owners have come to the realization themselves that lethal management is not helping because they have to repeat it year after year, and they don't like seeing wildlife killed generally. So they've come to us and asked to he- for help. Sure, it's on their terms. It's on their land often. Sometimes it's on public land with their animals. So we listen to that without compromising our science. And then if we come to an agreement, it works well so far. The problem is when we have the when we're dealing with the representatives of the livestock industry and they're very powerful and they're speaking to politicians. That's when we get extreme views. And of course, this ties into the culture wars and the polarization in in today's United States. Um, But if the representatives were actually listening a little more and less concerned that we're, you know, threatening their entire way of life, I think we'd, we'd find a little more common ground. So, you know, I just I keep talking, trying to stay patient, trying to explain it all and trying to put the livestock owners forward as our leaders uh, to talk about our experiments. That can be difficult, though. So take the Chilean experiment, our most recently completed one. Mm. Those Aymara people we worked with are so poor and marginalized. 
we can't even bring them anywhere to talk to their government. Mm. We just don't have the wherewithal. So we go talk to their government in their stead, right, in their place. And sometimes that's not great because we're outsiders. So it's a balancing act, nothing easy about it. So you mentioned experiments. Speaking of uh, more experiments, I was reading something uh, this morning. There's a bunch of cool video assets that I would love to get to, but they're like, it's like seven podcasts worth of material. So um, I'll just ask this. What is, what are, um, can you explain in, a, in more depth, uh, spatial, uh, what are they, spatial predictive models? Yeah, risk maps. And we have one on our website. I'd love it if that would be available to your listeners. Uh, we did sure. made a, ri a risk map for all of Wisconsin uh, so that you can actually type in your address and it uses Google map technology to zoom you down to near your address. And you can see the risk, the predicted risk of wolves attacking livestock in the same section. That's the one square mile area that you live in. Um, and we did that because we were trying to communicate exactly what John asked about. We were trying to communicate that risk is not ubiquitous. It's not everywhere. It is manageable. And if you understand it, you can prevent it. So we're trying to convey that to not only um, individuals who live there with wolves, but also government decision makers. We tried to in interest insurance companies, but it turns out there isn't a lot of insurance money in protecting livestock from predators, partly because the state pays compensation. So that's another thing. Uh, our state policy should be put in place to incentivize societal goals like protecting nature and protecting domestic animals. And the way you protect both of those is with non-lethal methods, pretty obviously. So how do you, what do you tell individuals, like when you said before, reach out to your legislators and those who are governing the individuals that, are, that they're representing, what are some, what's some of the information that they should go to them with in order to get the correct viewpoint or the correct information across so that it's not just going at it from a, an extreme of either side. It's these are the facts that I know and I've read up on, and this is the action we want you to take. Yeah, it's a natural, it's good question, but the answer is a little tough. It's a little good news, bad news. The good news is you can send a simpler message to your lawmakers. Tell them what you value and why. You don't need you don't need to go into the science and the information. You're going to get it, of course. You're going to be asked for science. You're going to be asked to defend your views with evidence, but that's not actually how laws are passed. Laws are passed when legislatures decide they have to do something for moral or ethical reasons. The science is kind of um, is needed to tell us what the current conditions are, what the future conditions might be like. And then when people try to justify the outcome they prefer by saying, for instance, well, wolves kill livestock, that's when you might want evidence to combat the claims. And, and I, I really advise people to, you know, uh, cite our studies, cite other studies that are good science, but don't try to argue the evidence yourself. Stick to the moral and ethical reasoning, because anyway, policymakers listen to that stuff, you know. It's common sense, really. So morally and ethically, and let me let me ask, because you've been, as with many of the people that we've had on here, why do you believe, or what, what do you see? Not, not why. why. Why is the wolf the center of this argument? Because it seems as though many carnivores are in the same boat. Mountain lions, pumas, coyotes, fox, bear. But the wolf, just like our political structure, it's really the catalyst for all of these good or bad fights that continue to happen surrounding our culture. Why do you believe that this is the animal that we have, as a human species, put this burden on? Yeah, wow. There's a lot there. That's a great question. You know, with the exception of Ojibwe and certain other groups that we found highly tolerant of wolves, it does seem like a universally hated species. Like I was looking for evidence around the world of cultures that were very tolerant of wolves. And I found some in, in the Far East. Uh, uh, but but one quote that sticks with me was the um, from the Dalai Lama's deputy. Who, who he left behind after he was in exile from, from Tibet. 
the deputy said to all village chiefs, protect all animals except the hyena and the wolf. Mm. So I, I was like, whoa, even in Tibet, you know, even with Buddhists, we're not getting some tolerance for the wolf. That's That was like my hitting my low point. And, and then I started to think, you know, what are we going to do? How is this species really going to make it? And I think the answer is that, you know, sure, people fear it, right? It's a, it's a big, scary dog that hunts in packs. That can be legitimately scary. But bears actually harm more people. So are we just misperceiving the, more, the greater threat? There's another idea that, that wolves are like bad dogs, like evil dogs. Like we know how to control dogs and wolves are just uncontrollable to us. So that's what makes people really aggressive towards them. Um, but I'd go back to what you said, John, that they're sort of an icon, a flashpoint for the culture wars in the U.S. today. They're, still, they're just animals doing what they always have done for millennia. Uh, and we've built them up into the symbol of political strife. So I think until we, you know, we have to talk to each other uh, until we have those discussions calmly and peacefully, the wolf is always going to be in the crosshairs as a flashpoint. There's a few points that I always, uh, that that come to mind, which is uh, bear, I mean, grizzlies are obviously far more dangerous to human beings, or at least statistics say so. Mountain lions are far more skilled predators as individuals. And so it seems completely unwarranted, but the, the only thing about coyotes and wolves, and they both seem to be just, just hated by so many folks, is that is what you're saying is that pack, um, it, it, you know, grizzlies are, are loners, lions are loners in, in most cases, uh, not in Africa, obviously, but in, on, on, on North American continent um, and South, but wolves hunt with this pack. And that's the, that's like the main thing that I can see, I guess, is a, it, it just drives more fear into the heart of individuals, uh, this pack mentality. And then there's another thing that I always hear from advocates, which is that wolves remind them of human beings. And I just wonder if we see if there's something there in the, in, in that uh, comparison. I mean, wolves live in family units for the most part, you know, occasionally an unrelated individual joins the family, but that's true in people too. And we see the teamwork, we see the cooperation. So I I have no secret to how one changes people's perceptions um, until we can, you know, un, uh, until we can take some of the emotional weight out of the symbol and talk about it a little bit more uh, open-mindedly. I I don't Mm -hmm. see much resolution. Uh, In fact, I'm advocating, my colleagues and I are advocating that the federal government designate wolves as protected non-game because this listing and delisting is just making people angry and leading to a lot of dead wolves. I, I, I I did want to touch on this briefly with the Wisconsin wolf hunt that just happened and how that was really sort of slammed through. And and like you said, Adrian, it's a lot of back and forth where it, this, like you said, the delisting and, and listing, and I have this conversation with multiple people about what, what's the right number? Are, the, are wolves recovered? What does what that look like? And, and it's that, that perception to us as humans is so vastly different as with everything else. And it's, and it's hard to not bring emotion into that. So when they have this, when this, when they delisted in late 2020 in, in late 20, and then held this wolf hunt in 20, early 21 in February, I, I don't, I, I read this somewhere and it, I, I, I can't remember who it is but something to the effect that Wisconsin basically has a black eye over them. And I, listen, I, I'm i just reading notes. I know I'm not stating this, my personal feeling about anyone who lives in Wisconsin. Um, I'm merely just reading, you know, up on what I, what I saw and what, you know, someone might have said. But how does, how does a state like Wisconsin, who has done, I believe, fairly good management of predators up until recently, how does... The, the state itself sort of get back to and, and get out of that social, uh, the social ramifications of what just occurred in February. Yeah, John, this is hitting close to home. I'll try to keep it brief for your listeners. A little bit of history here. Wolves recolonized Wisconsin on their own in the 70s. 
And between 2003 and this past election day, uh, they've moved on and off the U.S. endangered species list um, as the Fish and Wildlife Service seemed to try to want to get rid of responsibility for them, pass it to tribes and states, and uh, various federal courts uh return the wolf to the Endangered Species Act under uh, you almost always lawsuits from um, non-governmental organizations. And the reasons for that is that the Endangered Species Act specifies that uh, a species shouldn't be delisted until it has recovered all or a significant portion of its range at the time of listing. And when gray wolves were listed in the 1970s, the, this parts of or all of 30 states were their range. And we're only at about nine states now at most. So, and that's if you count the Northern Rockies, which is a different category of population. So it's very hard to argue that wolves have recovered all or a significant portion of their range. And the anti-wolf groups are hung up on the number of individual wolves, but the Endangered Species Act says nothing about the number of individual animals uh, for delisting. And that was wise by Congress in 1973 when they enacted the Endangered Species Act, because they were concerned with endangered species of all types, right? You know, uh, snail darters, e even some plants, and um, they didn't want to specify a number of individuals because that's kind of meaningless across those various uh, types of species. Instead, they specified a certain range, historical range, land area or water area. And that was actually visionary. And, and I, you know, I still say that it's one of the most powerful and wise laws on the planet for protecting nature. And plus it was incredibly bipartisan and it's still super supported. Like over 90% of the US public supports the Endangered Species Act. So we are stuck with that. It's the law of the land. Republicans have been trying to dismantle it for decades and defunding it. And some Democrats have sometimes joined in. So the Endangered Species Act is uh, always teetering on the edge. And I think we as citizens need to support it because it's one of the last um, wall, it's one of the last defenses against extinction. And all, the almighty dollar doesn't last very long, but nature can last forever if we, if we steward it, if we're caretakers of it. So I know that didn't quite answer your question, um, but I, I want to end on a positive note. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a teacher, right, in university. I, I, I cross paths with a lot of young people, and they tend to be more thoughtful and kinder than my generation. So I'm super optimistic about the next generation, and, mm. and I hope that uh, our, our scientific work is going to help give them some of that ammunition when they do need evidence to make uh, moral and, and ethical arguments. Mm -hmm. So con considering that... Um, you know, the ESA does seem to be an important document uh, in cases like this. To give special protections to a species uh, like we've done with horses and, uh, you know, like we're, we're talking about potentially doing with wolves, does it compromise the meaning of the doc, the document at all, or, or, or the idea at all? Does it, does it weaken the integrity of the, of a process like that? Um, or is that even an important consideration? No, I mean, Congress could do it, you know, in a single act, just like we've protected bald eagles, golden eagles, and other raptors, just like you say with horses and burrows mm -hmm. protection. Congress decided that certain kinds of animals are not huntable game. They could do the same with large predators, and I wouldn't limit it to gray wolves. I'd include grizzly bears, wolverines. Um, so... Congress could do that. I don't think it undermines the Endangered Species Act. In fact, it strengthens it. And I think it's consistent with the will of the majority of the U.S. Because in recent surveys out of Ohio State University and Colorado State University, Dr. Jeremy Ruscott or Dr. Mike Manfredo and their colleagues have shown how vastly popular wolves are and how unpopular lethal management is. So we just look, need to look for a 21st century model to preserve native species. Right. It's a good point because sometimes the argument is that the ESA is, uh, you know, the power of the ESA is to protect an animal until it's been reintroduced to a successful degree and then turn it over to the states to manage it. But um, it's a good point that that idea of special protections is actually part of, the, of, the, of what power the ESA affords to people. Yeah, that's right. When you hear the word wolf, what comes to your mind? 
Oh, I think of a majestic predator working and living in packs that are families and teams. And the howl is just one of the most beautiful sounds in nature, I think. That's awesome. Adrian, just give everybody where they can find your work for the Coexistence Lab really quick. Sure. Now, do you, you, are you saying I should be saying the URL or could I put it in the chat? No, you can say the URL so everybody can type it, but I'm also going to have it in the description as well. Okay, great. Great, great, great. Yeah, so I'd, I'd, I'd love it if people would visit faculty.nelson.wisc.edu backslash Trevis. That's T-R-E-V-E-S. And I look forward to hearing from your listeners. We'll post it, absolutely. Adrian Travis, thanks for joining us. Howls to everyone out there, and we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Looking to support Wolf Connection or sponsor one of the wolves in our pack? Just go to wolfconnection.org, click on the Donate tab, and find out more information. 